اليوم من امام منزل شخصيه لبنانيه امريكيه مميزه ببافلي هيلز بحييكم ورح نتعرف اليوم بحلقتنا على السيد انتوني فينسنت زني من اكبر رجال اعمال بامريكا خلينا نتعرف اكثر على شخصيته المميزه بهالحلقه Mr. Anthony Vincent Zerny, thank you for receiving us in your beautiful house here in Beverly Hills in Los Angeles. I know you are an entrepreneur, a producer, you are into oil and gas business uh, and you have also good vineyards. Um, you, are, you were born here in Ohio from immigrants' parents. Tell us more about uh, how did your parents emigrate from Lebanon? to Ohio? Well, as I've been told by the stories, um, my mother and father immigrated in about 1915 from Beirut, from Lebanon. And they came via Marseille. Their, um, their immigration was a little bit complex, um, but I, uh, I think the important thing was dad had found that coming in through, I believe it was Sea Island, or, the, uh, or Ellis Island, <clears throat> off of New York. And he found that many of the immigrants spoke virtually no English or American. And being that he was of many languages and could read and write, he was quickly garnered into an interpreter's job mm. on the island. And his job was to help assist immigration. So that started the brief tenure of uh, Romanes Elias Zanne mm -hmm. as the interpreter for the U.S. government on his entry into the United States. Mm -hmm. And why did he decide to leave Lebanon then and to come to the United States? My uncle John, my mother's brother, youngest brother, there were about, I believe, seven or eight that immigrated from Beirut, from Lebanon, to Australia, New Zealand, one of the sisters, Sultani, went to uh, Brazil, and the rest came to Ohio, United States. And uh, <clears throat> that emanated from a very interesting story that my Uncle John had told me some years back. He stated that he had a slight incarceration and altercation with a Turkish officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Ara took hold in his youth he didn't like um, what was happening to Lebanon, so he was somewhat rebellious, which didn't change to the day he died. However, he was going to be hanged the next morning. My father got information on that, and he went and secured a um, colonel's uniform. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but we'll leave that part out. <clears throat> um, a, a, a uniform that... Uh, he portrayed himself as the colonel mm. of uh, the Turkish army. Went to the jailhouse inside Batruan, not too far from the center, on the outskirts somewhat, I don't know where. Uncle John was in the cell early, early in night, probably, as I understand, before midnight. And as he entered the, um, the cell, the jail, the jail facility, Uncle John heard noise and shouting and ranting. And he asked in Arabic, where is that dog that hit one of my officers? And the sergeant who was in charge of the um, jail pointed to Uncle John, John Khoury, Hanna Khoury, Khoury. 
uh, he, he told the sergeant to open up the jail cell and he walked in and he gave him a hit to the day that Uncle John died. He had a, oh, a large, large, you know, split on his lip that had stitches. And, my, and when he would told me the story, he says, your father gave me this. But he saved his life. Yeah. But he saved his life. Mm -hmm. He persuaded the sergeant, let him take him outside in the dark. He shot two shots in the air, presumably that would kill Uncle John. And he went off and picked up my mother, went over to the Syrian Alps, mm -hmm. out of, uh, I guess, Aleppo, or um, mm -hmm. it was in Damascus to Aleppo, mm -hmm. over to um, Versailles, La Havre. I'm not sure. And that's how he immigrated to New York. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were born there in Ohio? Yes. And uh, tell us more about how you, did you spend your childhood uh, with your parents, your sister and brothers. And tell us also about uh, your mother, who seems to be a great lady. Well, uh, let me take the first four points that you brought forward on this interview. Growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio, about three blocks from the river, the Ohio River, was a very poor, as they know it today as a barrio, we knew it as the slums. Flats were apartments that um, were on over a printing press. A German printer was on the ground floor. We had the second floor and the third floor. These are rooming houses, really. And the bath facility was on the third floor. One bathroom for 18 different tenants. We being one of them. She grew up in a very, uh, sh I shouldn't say that, let me correct that. She was living in Cincinnati under those conditions. No hot water, boiled on the stove, certainly no furnace for heat. And the winters get brutally cold, freezing and below. But she never complained. And uh, we were born in this three-room flat. The four children that survived, my my two brothers and sister. And that was a life of interesting. A very cute moment in that time. I thought chicken, when you were going to eat chicken, it was wings and a drumstick. I had no idea there was a breast of chicken until some time later. But that didn't matter. It really didn't matter. There was such love in my family. My mother's reasoning for that behind it. She was the driven force from day one till the day she died. And she lived to be one month short of 95. Mm -hmm. We brought her to California. Mm -hmm. uh, but she, she installed in us a Lebanese tradition that is in many other traditions. They're in the Spanish, the Russian. It's a family unity. It's caring for each other. And the family love is one thing, but the mother's love is unparalleled. You're right. As I told you earlier, that's the most demanding, unforgiving love of all. Indeed. We're very blessed. So with that first part being said, migrating to Cincinnati only happened because my dad had relatives. Mm -hmm. His mother, my grandmother, Bader, mother, she lived in a rooming house right across the hall from us. And she helped mom raise me and my sister. Mm -hmm. um, the third question, what was her tenacity? She was a very strong, small woman. Five foot two, but her heart was seven foot five. <laughs> she was giving, very, very caring for everyone. The people upstairs that were, whoever lived there. And she changed the sheets, did the cleaning so that they could get free rent. And um, grandma would help her, the neighbors, the Lebanese women and men who immigrated on Third Street in Ohio, they all kind of pitched in and took care of mm -hmm. each other. Something that's missing today. Yeah, indeed. Your neighbors are one thing, but caring neighbors, sharing neighbors, we were fortunate to have that. So my life was good. Mm -hmm. Poor maybe, but good. But good. That's what made you 
a good person, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I'm I sure. I think her prayers, her prayers <laughs> might have helped a lot. Uh -huh. Did they speak Arabic? You know, you told me your father used to speak seven languages. He did. Did he used to speak Arabic with you? No, he did not. He spoke impeccable English. Okay. My mother would speak Arabic. Okay. Just as my wife's mother, who speaks Russian, yeah. speaks uh, Russian to the ch our children. Yeah. Same, same scenario. Uh, what little Arabic that I've retained, and I've been seeing the tear, has been from hearing and using uh, in the very basic forms mm -hmm. of uh, my Lebanese. Mm -hmm. It's carried me quite a way through life. Mm -hmm. Even though people are forgiving, they appreciate that I retain some of it. Of course. You started yourself, uh, your career, at six years old. At six years old, we all had to contribute. Mm -hmm. My brothers, whatever. Mine had to be the most meager of all. So I had a newspaper corner that my brother Joe, Yusuf, mm -hmm provided. Mm -hmm. And I made a few pennies a day mm -hmm. selling newspapers. But that was my first job. The second job was singing telegrams for Western Union. <laughs> Happy birthdays and congratulations. And I did that till I was about 13. Mm -hmm. So those are the first two jobs that started me on the independence of working. And you, then you started uh, dancing for a living. Ah. <clears throat> that one I, do, I won't fly by so fast. My sister, Betty, Elizabeth, had the housework chores, as a girl normally would have. And mom was away at the factory and dad. And she kind of enticed and bribed me, telling me that if I would just stand there and let her dance to the records, she would do the vacuuming or the dishwashing as my chores, mm -hmm. the jobs I had. I thought that was a much better deal than washing. So I'd stand there and she would dance all around me. And as we go along, all of a sudden I was moving a little bit. <laughs> and by the time I was about 13 and a half, she was, I was dancing with her and um, she started me on dancing in my life. Yeah. It carried me a long way, but I'll let you Ask the questions as you wish. Yeah. So uh, you, came, you came to San Francisco. Uh, you were like uh, 18 and a half. And you started... Yeah, but to get there, <clears throat> I was working as a mailboy at a, at a life insurance company uh -huh. in, in Cincinnati. In, in Ohio, yeah. Those days I was maybe 16, 16 and a half. Okay. Going into my senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. I passed a business... In the United States, Arthur Murray was very big mm -hmm. in his day. He had about 150 studios, and they were the premier. The next one was Fred Astaire. Yeah. And then the one below that was Velos and Yolanda. All had dance studios. And I passed Arthur Murray's dance studio in Main Street, Cincinnati. Hot summer day in the 90s. Humid. And I had 45 minutes, so I stopped in to see my cousin, Carlos. To make that story a little bit short, it was air-conditioned, had a great environment, ballroom, music. And I thought, wow, this is not a job. That's, that's, that's a way of life. <laughs> so the, sec the receptionist called my cousin out, and he whisked me into the ballroom. And to make it a little bit brief, he had me dance with a particular dancer who was a dance director. And I was dancing with her. That led me to the training room. Mm -hmm. So after my insurance job at night, I would go for three hours a night and train okay. to, to um, teach. Mm -hmm. Well, making what little money I made as a mailboy, within five, six hours of teaching, I was equaling my weekly salary. So I thought that was a great move. Indeed. So that took me into dancing, learning, and then into the profession. Now? And then you moved to San Francisco at 18 Came years old. Came out when I was 18 and a half, and a half yeah. for Arthur Murray in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, worked there for a very short time, just mm -hmm. a matter of weeks. They were having serious problems in San Diego studio. Mm -hmm. He asked if I would try it. Mm -hmm. Down to San Diego. Next thing I know, I'm in Los Angeles. 
and except for my trips home, been here ever since. ولد أنتوني فينسنت زاني بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية من بعد ما كانوا هاجروا أهله بالقرن التاسع عشر وبدأ بالعمل بعمر ست سنين خلينا نكتشف أكثر عنه من بعد هالبريك decided to stop dancing to go into another business which is uh, the real estate yes. why did you stop dancing and is it still a hobby today well my wife dances quite nicely uh -huh. uh, but we don't do much of it um, love music we all do the children everyone we're a very music happy dancing foolish family uh, but the question was why did I leave? Yeah. Uh, one of the students at the studio out by 20th Century Fox was in the country club development business, golf courses and country club. And he offered me a job back in um, Cleveland, Ohio. So I thought maybe it's a time for a change. Although the dancing career gave me many, many opportunities including at the studios at 20th Century Fox, where I had um, the choreography, which was, again, another elevation to the dancing art. And it opened up a lot of windows that I was not really taking advantage of at the time. Anyway, I went to work for Mr. Frankfurt and um, learned a little bit about real estate, selling, secured my real estate license, Pursued another one with him in New York, again, a little deeper into real estate, another license. Came back to California, another license. So the postgraduate courses of real estate were the foundation of moving into real estate. Mm -hmm. That's how that started. Then also, you started a new business after the real estate. It was being a producer. You produced like more than 20 feature films. Other television and motion television picture and over motion period pictures. Time. How did you get into the movie business? Well, that is why I think I want to clarify that answer. The earliest stages when I was choreographing and dancing, mm -hmm. uh, writers that you met uh, had uh, scripts and they were all very hungry. We weren't, any of us weren't really very financially comfortable. Mm -hmm. So one fellow asked me, would I like to invest a number of dollars in a script, and he told me the storyline. We were having a breakfast, and I said, okay. So I did. Well, that particular strip happened to be a movie that turned out to be a classic. It um, was The Sting with Robert Redford and yeah. Paul Newman. And I, uh, I did quite well for a little investment. That was my entree behind the camera. Choreography, of course, is in front. And um, Another one came up, Holiday Abroad. Mm -hmm. So there were two or three that were, I was just a little check writer in a very humble amount. But it got the writers to produce and get the scripts on the screen. So you got then, famous. Then as a dancer, mm -hmm. as a choreographer, I was given some wonderful opportunities. 
One of the best ones, I think, um, would be from a fellow Michael Kidd, choreographer, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I was able to assist him, and that offered me um, a whole new horizon in terms of motion pictures, which led to other films. Yeah. They were not my films, the studio's films. You know, no business like show business with uh, the tropical heat wave number of um, any of those films. Then it evolved to Aladdin Entertainment. Yeah, this is one of your companies um, because I know that you have a variety of companies like uh, Aladdin Developers and uh, others also you would like maybe to talk about um, as a famous entrepreneur here in Los Angeles. A famous entrepreneur? Yeah. <laughs> Not so sure about that at all. <laughs> Uh, I would say that, um, well, we created Aladdin Developers mm -hmm. as the parent corp, parent corporation, um, March of 1961. That's when I, after I left a major company called Litton Industries, which was a conglomerate mm -hmm. in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. Aladdin was designed to control quality and costs. If you don't really watch your costs, you're soon out of business. Mm -hmm. And the quality is very important to me. Whatever Aladdin has built, I've never been unhappy with any of it. Now, the variety of things that Aladdin was involved in, and I think that's kind of germane to this interview, would be um, apartment buildings, but lifestyles in apartment buildings. There are waterways, crossover bridges, Besides, in the early stages of the gymnasiums and the saunas and all the things that are now a norm, in the early days, it was quite unique. Mm -hmm. Another concept that we initiated, and I think we were one of the first, if not the first, was an apartment house in Marina del Rey, out by the ocean. Yeah. One building of about a couple hundred units was for pilots. Another unit was for the stewardesses, but they didn't mix. Okay. And that worked out well for American Airlines and United. Another singular was for couples. That didn't flourish as well. But then we did the Casa Contenta chain. And Aladdin uh, was able to build apartment houses mm -hmm. in about eight different suburbs. Mm -hmm. From that, we kind of evolved into convalescent homes, some cute general hospitals out in Northridge. Um, lastly, housing. I didn't realize that I was so naive when it came to housing, but I was. <laughs> so trial and error allowed me to go into the home business. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do tracks particularly. They were customized houses, even though these areas were um, mm -hmm. high-end homes. I know also that you are involved in oil and gas uh, business. We are now, mm -hmm. the last 15 years. And it's. It's doing you want a little bit about that? Yeah, I would uh, love to. Okay. We're in the um, exclusively Oklahoma, mm -hmm. U U.S., the oil and gas business. We're um, not necessarily wildcat. We don't do wildcatting. But we do penetration with cracking devices, uh, more technical advancements of existing fields that have been left by the big companies. And um, it, it's just a niche that follows entrepreneurialism. I recognized the potential and started with this particular company uh, almost 15 years ago, maybe 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. Very trustworthy friend. And uh, we continue every year with more and more wells. Mm -hmm. Good. So that's the quick flyby yes, of oil and gas. story of oil and gas. Now I will talk about uh, your, your maybe your latest uh, involvement into uh, wine. You have Vincent <laughs> Vineyards. And, Vincent Vineyards. Yeah, and we just tasted the wine, the this red one. It's quite nice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really <laughs> exquisite. It is. So uh, why, why is it about uh, wine? And you told me even you went into uh, Californian wine, but also Lebanese. Some Lebanese, uh, <laughs> or oh, not yet. <laughs> well, I can easily tell you why. This has been a new entry in our lives. 
uh, we started the Vincent Vineyard. Uh, we bought the property about six years ago up in Santa Ynez, California, about two hours from here in Beverly Hills. Uh, the, the property was a walnut farm, but that's not significant. We had to pull all the trees out, prepare the soil. It took about a year and then put the irrigation system in. And we elected to go with um, the Bordeaux, the Cabernet. Mm -hmm. We selected a very fine winery that I won't mention their names, not for the screen, <laughs> uh, but they're eminent in the wine world for the last hundred years or close to it. We took those vines that they grow and put the Cabernets in our vineyard, which now embodies um, the first bottling was in 09 of the white Cabernet Sauvignon. And then we have uh, five varietals, reds, Sauvignon, Franc, Petit Verdot, Syrah, and Vicouvet. That winery business will be flourishing if my wife will be working her little bones off. <laughs> and uh, it will be uh, we'll talk Tanya's job. Tanya later. And then hopefully maybe my daughter, Jennifer, my son, Tony, you know, whatever the children want to do is a family unit as long as they're together, as long as that love and fun and, and enjoy the, the fruit of the land. Yeah. So the wine business should grow mm -hmm. in time, inshallah. It's your passion. I, I feel you're passionate well, becoming more and that. more of a passion. Mm. I really enjoy seeing the juices, seeing the quality improve and improve. And I feel that we're being very selective yeah. in terms of trying not, it to won't be, be on shopping shelves. Mm -hmm. It'll be in hopefully the, the better deserving restaurants and maybe a distribution company that we've been holding off on. So we went through very quickly uh, about your childhood and career. But I would love to know uh, what are the best moments of your career and what are the worst moments in your career? The best and the worst moments. Mm. Now that's a question I have not been asked before. Let's take because the worst. Let's take the worst. The best if there are not the worst. The best comes after the worst. Yeah, I'll start with the worst. Okay. I think my worst moments in, in my life okay. were seeing my brother Joe pass away at such a young age, 59. My brother Elias, the 47. Uh, those are the worst moments. My mother, she lived a hard but a full life. And I'm glad the good Lord took her to keep her suffering down. So even though there's a better life that we believe in, it's still very sad to see family depart. The better moments for the, now for the change. The better moments were seeing your children born, having the wife take good care of the children, and I've been very blessed there. فينسيت بتغني عن جد انسان مميز من بعد ما علم الرقص انتج افلام عديده وايضا بنى شركات مهمه جدا خلينا نتعرف اكثر على حياته العائليه من بعد هالبريك الالي
Let us talk about your, your personal life, your family. I know how attached you are to your family and uh, this is a blessing. And you are a self-made man. That's what makes you also uh, value important things. Um, you were married uh, in 1964, uh, yes. the first time. You, your last wife was uh, Miss uh, California. Uh, she was Miss Los Angeles. Miss Los Angeles. Miss California, Miss USA. Miss USA. Runner up in, in, the, in Miss, Miss Universe. Miss Universe. Mm -hmm. So uh, a very famous. Uh, uh, well, she deserved it. She deserved it. And I know it was not, it was really hard to, to get to know her and to, to really uh, uh, have a family and marry her, have kids because she was famous and she was engaged, I think. You think right. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, committed to another man mm -hmm. who was a superstar in baseball. Uh -huh. I, I didn't know that. But um, as fate has it, if you believe and you want something, and if it's meant for you, mm -hmm. if it's meant for you, um, it will happen. It, it will happen. Maybe not in the way we'd like to see it in our time, but it will happen. Uh, and she gave me two wonderful children. Yeah, a boy and a, a girl. My son, Anton, yeah. Jr., and Jennifer Lynn. Yeah. And Tony is um, an entrepreneur mm -hmm. in Newport Beach, California. Uh, he uh, has a software company, among other assets. Jennifer be chose to be a teacher. She loves to help children. She's going to be a great mom one day. Yeah. And you have grandchildren. Pardon? You have yes. grandchildren. I have two grandchildren from Tony. Yeah. Uh, one is six years old, and Tony the third, Tony Vincent's Anthony the third, <laughs> is a little over two years old. Uh huh. So now you, you are happy? You have your son? No, I'm not happy. And you're no, not no, happy. No, 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 no. I want more sons. You want more? And I want I Jennifer you to have had, some you had You had the, 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 the Anthony, the junior, and then the junior, junior. So I thought you were, okay, satisfied. Of course I'm satisfied. <laughs> and I know also that uh, you have a, a lovely wife, Tanya. Indeed. You've been married for 11, 11 years, years now. Almost and you have years. Uh, mm -hmm. twins. Two eight and a half years old. Girls, eight Jennifer, years old. Je I'm sorry. Catherine Michelle. Yeah. And Tanya named her. I named Joanne Elizabeth. Uh -huh. Elizabeth is after my sister, who's alive, and Jo, Joanne, is after Chaya Yusuf. Yeah, beautiful. Tell us, what is the difference between being a father then, when at a young age, and being a father today? Well, <sighs> father brings responsibility. And I think that's key, I hope, Whoever listens to this interview that becomes a father or is a father will understand that that responsibility should be brought on yourself with pleasure. By that I mean not only providing the financial means and the education mm -hmm. and the clothes and the medical, mm -hmm. but the spiritual guidance. Mm -hmm. Without that, the children are apt to fall wayside. And that responsibility is a huge one. It's not just church on Sunday. Of course. Or a prayer at a meal. But it's your actions, what you do, what they see, how you live your home life, how you see your business life. I know that my son Tony knows my values. And to encapsulate my values, he practices them. Makes me very proud. Mm -hmm. If you can walk this earth and tell your children, no one has been cheated. No one lost on your account to my personal gain or your personal gain. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are some of the spiritual. Whatever the religion, whatever the, the chosen path, just practice it. Don't let bureaucracy and politics and stature. By that I mean um, something I've always said to people from time to time. Respectability grows with the checkbook. Money brings sometimes the wrong people. Yeah. But that respectability can be turned on all of the people. 
if you use it properly. Because what we use is called money is great. I love it if you use it right. Mm -hmm. Not only charity, but use it right. Live right, share it, let people see, and then makes them wonder, how did you do this? Well, Thomas Jefferson had the best one. He says, you know, it's funny. The harder I work, the more I got. Beautiful and so true. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. I what? think Thomas was a very small man. Yeah, indeed. Go ahead. And what are the um, most important values you like to convey to your children today, mm. especially to your it's twins? It's a good question. I like that question. The most important value to the children and your wife? Yeah. Fairness. That's a, that's a simple word, but it really spreads its wings yeah, and over it's, many it's planets. It's really difficult and complex. Fairness. How do you treat somebody fairly when they injure you? Or how do you treat somebody fairly that has nothing? Or how would you treat someone fairly uh, in terms of the, the theory? Fairness is a word of application, effort. Get into your pockets when you don't have someone advertising for you. Give when no one knows. Because the period of life will come that will be called. And when I get in front of him, if I get there, inshallah, I don't want him to say, oh, Anton, sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. You had all the praise and, and, and on the planet Earth. I want him to say, Anton, in the natural thing. The next value is charity. And again, it, it just almost marries right with fairness. The charity of doing things, don't advertise, don't tell people how wonderful you are. Of course. Uh, so I'd like them to understand that, that term. And we all make mistakes. One parts of our life, another, we do things that are maybe not proper. Of course. But you have to come to grips because God made us knowing we are imperfect. But it's our job to turn that imperfect into the right path and to try and meditate or pray or whatever your expertise is to find out what His will is for you and your children and your wife and their children. And that value is the most important because it leads you away from drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. womanizing, or for men, women, things that are not healthy. So the Bible has good and bad, but there's an awful lot of good. And the last thing I can come to my mind, what can you give? Understand what your religion tells you, mm -hmm. no matter what it is. All of them that I know of, my personal opinion, has faith. And um, I would say without faith, you have no religion. Right. Because what is faith? We can't see the wind, but we know it's there. خبرنا أنتوني فينسنت زاني أنه الفرق كبير بين أنه يكون والد بعمر صغير وولد بعمر كبير ولكن بعد ما خبرنا عن علاقاته بوطنه لبنان خلينا نعرف أكثر من بعد هالبريك الإعلاني
I know that you visited Lebanon only once. Yes. In 1962, for six weeks. And you have very nice and good memories of that. Excellent. Why didn't you come back? Well, I would say that my life got very busy. I ended up in Africa uh, and all around the United States in real estate developments, businesses. Always th think myself, they say, are you, I say, I'm an American first. But I'm Lebanese, just as the Jews are Jews first and they're American second. Yeah. But not all of them, just some. Muslims. Muslim? What are you? You're Libyan? Are you North African? Are you American? What is Muslim? That's the faith. We don't want to fall into those traps. So I didn't go back to Lebanon primarily because that six week was such a wonderful trip. That you want, you I didn't want know to... if I could ever surpass it. <laughs> Tell us more about these days you spent in, in Beirut. Oh. Well, 20th Century Fox sent over publicity prints, which I was not aware of, films that I was involved in. And when I got to the St. George and registered, they were just too nice. And I asked for a room, and I got more than a room. And I asked for Finjian Nahui. <laughs> I think and I have ended way. up with the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't really pick it up until my cousin El Gassain. Uh, not my cousin, I'm sorry, my friend from uh, Cairo, yeah. the French University narrator. Mm -hmm. He said, did you see this article, front page on El Nahar? Mm, Nahar. The photo and the Lebanese son comes back home. Mm -hmm. They really did things that I was totally unaware of. Well, it was gratifying for me, but it was fantastic for my father. My mother never got to see it. Mm. And, but that trip, we would go to, um, I didn't know, Haït de Zaytun was the Red District. Mm -hmm. But I walked through there from the St. George, took a cab, whatever, and went to these fine little restaurants in Nasser on the side of the cliff yeah. when you go down to Ralshi, yeah. and then over to Bahamdun, up to Safar. And then my father liked to play cards, so we went to Tula, <laughs> where he's from, um, and Edmund, the wrestler, yeah. Edmund Zamni. He, he, he made my trip fantastic. Yeah. Um, the people, my goodness. You hear a lot of adversity. They say, oh, everybody wants to know what have you got? What can they get a hold of? That may exist in every nation. Of course. But in the country of Lebanon, the beauty, the Mediterranean, the, the Uttas, the topography, the humbleness of some and the egotistical approach of the others. Yeah. Uh, I won't mention family names, but I have to tell you, up in Bahamdun, I met one of the more affluent Lebanese. When he found out about certain things, if he was flying at 100,000, he was walking on sea level with me. We had a lot to talk about, had a lot of fun. And uh, that opened up probably the, the creme de creme of Beirut. So I had a great diversity crammed into those six weeks. Mm -hmm. The worst part was going up to Tula and Tula, getting sick from on where the you figs. Are, yeah, you are, uh, your origins are from Tula. Your, My your father, father is from Tula. And Emmy from Bait of Khuri and Batrun. Mm -hmm. So um, we, I really think I captured an awful lot. I will go back. I would like to take my wife and children we back. Will ha we ha I wanted to ask you if you wanted to go back there at least for a visit, but this time it will be 12 weeks. <laughs> no, maybe two. <laughs> maybe two only? Why? We don't deserve... Are you, I, are you um, afraid to go back and see that people have changed, the country has changed after the... 35 years of war, because you went, you, well, you visited first in 1962, the war started only in 1975. No. Do you apprehend the no, coming, going no. back now? I really don't fear anything in terms of uh, change. 
I don't fear communism, fascism, socialism. I dislike it intensely. But I don't mind uh, the change because I always look for the good in people or in the nation. It's always there. It's always there. So you, you so think I, that there is hope for Lebanon to, to be well, I, what I, it I, I tell my to wife, be. I keep pointing out on the camera, off camera, um, that we went to um, Zahli and ate uh, at the fine restaurant, went on with the driver into um, the Bakal Valley, and we saw Feruz and um, Sabah yeah. at the festival in Baalbek. My goodness, you can't reproduce that. I've been in Greek uh, amphitheaters in Rome and whatever. Not that, not Baalbek. You're right. And so, am I afraid of change? No, they'll still be there. But the people will be different. Mm -hmm. But I've adjusted with people all of my life. Whether I'm dealing with kings or a gas attendant, I, I find that part of my life not difficult. Mm. Everybody loves the laugh and everyone loves the dance. You're right. And you are good at these two dancing and making us laugh. Lousy and, joke teller. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, no, but, and you make us cry too. Pardon? <laughs> You made us cry too, off the camera. <laughs> oh, that was not intentional. No. But my mother makes me cry once in a while as yes. well. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Mr. Anthony Vincent Zanni, thank you. I know I wanted to say to all the viewers tonight that exclusively this is the first time you let uh, journalists come into your house for an it interview. It is the first time. So I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for oh. this trust. I uh, hope you're... you're studio and uh, those that might be watching might grab something good out of the interview. Yeah, of course. Would please me. But Lebanon does very well in Africa. I, we didn't touch on that. Uh -huh. They do very well. Mm -hmm. The Lebanese people have a pension for work, success. Mm -hmm. The only danger that power is the power and ego. This we can see in our government too. Well, we can preach, but we have to stay the word humble is not a good word. Just stay realistic. Mm -hmm. All that materialism, it's fun to get them, gather more and more and more, but it can all disappear. You're right. It's how you use it. Right. Anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, <laughs> all of you. Thank you. Yalla. <laughs> <laughs>